What's up guys, it's Dolmatter here, and today we are going to be talking about Russia uh, threatening the UK with some kind of wily e. Coyote-esque ideas. Um, it's kind of funny, kind of dark in a way, but the reason I f it's kind of humorous is because the Russia uses a lot of these threats as if they have this like super high-tech technology, and it is, you know, absolutely devastating technology. I mean, nuclear bombs have been around for almost 100 years now at this point. It'll be, you know, 80 years and just a couple of years, the 80th anniversary of the first nuclear weapons ever used. And, um, but Russia tends to, you know, they really like to brag about their hypersonic missiles, despite the fact that in the West we've had these probably since the 70s, definitely since the 80s. Um, the nuclear tsunami is the big one that they threatened uh, Britain with. So if we actually watch the specific video here, the depths of the Russian Sea. It approaches the target at a depth of one kilometer at a speed of 200 kilometers per hour. There's no way of stopping this underwater drone. The warhead is on its way as a yield of up to 100 megatons. The explosion of this thermonuclear torpedo by Britain's coastline will cause a gigantic tsunami wave up to 500 meters high. Such a barrage alone also carries extreme doses of radiation. Having passed over the British Isles, it will kill whatever might be left of them into a high radioactive desert. So, yeah, this is Russian state-sponsored television, by the way, so this shit is actually backed by the Kremlin. Um, and this is actually an idea that's been uh, kind of floated around since World War II. Uh, so if we look over here onto the Tsunami Bomb Wikipedia page, which yesterday they actually have a Wikipedia page. Um, tests were conducted by Professor Thomas Leach in the University of Auckland in Wahagaraparu off the coast of Auckland and New Caledonia between 1945 and 1950, or 1944 and 1945. British and U.S. defense chiefs were eager to see its development and considered potentially as important as the atomic bomb. It was expected to cause massive damage to coastal cities or coastal defenses. The weapon was only tested using small explosives and never on full scale. 3,700 tests, explosions were conducted over a seven-month period. The tests revealed that a single explosion would not produce a tsunami, but concluded that a line of 2 million kilograms, or 4,400,000 pounds, of explosives about 8 kilometers off the coast would create a destructive wave. Details of the experiments, codenamed Project SEAL, were released to the public by Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade in 1999 and are available in the archives New Zealand and Wellington and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography Archives in San Diego, California. A 1968 research report sponsored by the U.S. Office of Naval Research addressed this hypothesis of coastal damage due to large explosion-generated waves and found theoretical and experimental evidence showing it to be relatively inefficient in wave-making potential the most wave energy dissipated by breaking on the continental shelf before reaching the shore. Analysis of the declassified documents in 1999 by the University of uh, Waikato, Waikato uh, so I'm guessing that's a New Zealand university. Yep, they have all these uh, Maori names, and I'm not exactly sure how to properly pronounce them. Um, anyway, suggested the weapon would be viable. No specific targets for the weapon were identified, but in 2013, New Zealand broadcaster and author Ray Waru suggested coastal fortifications in Japan ahead of the invasion of the Japanese home islands. Egypt magazine Al Osboa claimed that the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake in Somalia is intentionally caused by a nuclear weapon uh, detonated in a strategic position under the ocean, which is probably not true. Um, I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing Al Osboa is probably like some uh, conspiratorial type paper out of Egypt. Uh, no, it actually appears to just be a regular newspaper. It's kind of hilarious. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, Soviets. Andrei uh, Sakharov was the leader of the Project Levina otherwise known as avalanche in English. Its goal was to detonate 100 million tons of strategically placed TNT, causing waves that would devastate the U.S. Pacific and Atlantic coasts. So, again, this is something that, you know, as kind of crazy, you know, as I said earlier, wily e. Coyote-esque as it does seem, um, nations have been working on this since about the midpoint of World War II. Um, 
and prior to you know the feasibility of nuclear weapons um, this was actually proposed as a you know kind of strategy for how to begin the invasion of the home islands of Japan you know wipe out the coasts and then send the troops in and you know clean up whatever's left um, that being said I I'd be very surprised if Russia would ever do anything like this. It's basically a suicide mission. Um, if Russia decided to wipe out the UK, obviously that would damage NATO a certain amount. You know, UK being one of the most powerful countries within NATO, one of the largest um, uh, economies, one of the largest population bases, um, one of the only nuclear powers within NATO. You know, you obviously have Canada, the United States, France. Um, essentially, I think that's it. I believe that's it for nuclear powers within NATO. Um, it's just the three of them. Or sorry, I said Canada. I meant the UK, France, and the United States. Um, so you just have the three nuclear powers uh, within NATO. So taking out some of those nuclear weapons would obviously be beneficial. Uh, but I'm not actually sure how much that would actually damage Britain's nuclear capabilities. One, because I don't think the wave would be nearly as large as they tend to think it will. Um, you know, two, because I. I don't know where the nuclear silos in the UK are positioned, um, how properly fortified they are, but Britain's a very rainy continent. I imagine they're probably very well waterproofed. So I would assume a lot of the, you know, even if the waves did reach the nuclear silos, it would largely just go over them. I assume Britain has nuclear submarines of some capability, which means they'll already be in the water floating around somewhere. Um, and that be, and then again, even let, let's assume that, you know, it's total devastation, you know, the UK is completely 100% gone. And then you've got the United States and France and the rest of the European Union to deal with, the rest of NATO to deal with. Um, you know, a lot of NATO-aligned countries. China s would honestly probably side with NATO in that situation because then they could land, grab a lot of Eastern Russia. And they tend to be uh, very pragmatic in a lot of ways. I, You know, China likes to... China and Ally aren't friends. It's more of an enemy of my enemy is my friend type thing. But if if China sees Russia in a situation where they're about to get the shit kicked out of them, I would not be at all surprised if China joins up with the Western allies as a way to quickly land, land grab some of Siberia from Russia. Because if they can move into that territory, if they can grab it, um, you know, just not give it back, right? Who's, who's going to stop them? Kind of similar to what Russia did during and after World War II, where obviously they were invaded, so it was a little bit different than, uh, you know, China being a, uh, you know, joining a Western coalition against Russia. But if we assume something similar to that would happen, where, you know, Russia just kind of moved in and basically took control of the eastern half of Europe, Russia could very much, or China, sorry, could very much just move in and take over a large chunk of Russia, and you could see you know, who's going to kick them out of there, right? Unless you want to declare war on China, you're not going to. Kind of similar to how after World War II, unless you wanted to declare war on Russia, you weren't going to get the Eastern European countries back, even the ones that we had, you know, defense agreements with prior to that, like Poland. Um, that being said, uh, I'd be, again, I'd be very surprised if this actually happens. It seems like a lot of posturing from the Russian government. Um, you know, the, this is the same people that brag about, again, their hypersonic missiles, stuff that, uh, you know, th We've had hypersonics since, I believe, the 60s. I actually have that opened up right here as well. Um, uh, manufactured The first manufactured object to achieve hypersonic flight was a two-stage bumper rocket consisting of the WAC Corporal second stage set atop a V2 first stage in February 1949 at White Sands, which I believe is in the States. Uh, yeah, New Mexico. Uh, the rocket reached a speed of 8,288.12 kilometers, or 5,150 miles per hour, or approximately Mach 6.7. The vehicle, however, burned in the atmospheric reentry, and only charred remnants were found. On April uh, 1961, Russian Major Yuri Gagarin became the first human to travel at hypersonic speed during the world's first piloted orbital flight. Soon after, in May 1961, Alan Shepard became the first American and second person to achieve hypersonic flight when his capsule, capsule re-entered the atmosphere at above Mach 5 at the end of his suborbital flight over the Atlantic Ocean. In November 1961, Air Force Major Robert White flew the X-15 research airplane at speeds over Mach 6 on October 3, 1967 in California, and X-15 
reached Mach 6.7. The re-entry problem of space vehicles was extensively studied. The NASA X-43A flew a scramjet for 10 seconds and then glided for 10 minutes on its last flight in 2004. The Boeing X-51 Wave Rider flew on a scramjet for 210 seconds in 2013, finally reaching Mach 5.1 on its fourth flight test. The hypersonic regime has since become the subject of further study during the 21st century in strategic competition between the United States, India, Russia, and China. Um, so yeah, the hypersonics have existed in one form or another basically since more or less exactly you know the end of world war ii right as soon as we acquired the german technology of the v2 rockets we started working on it ourselves the russians started working on it and within you know five years or so there was already a, you know the space race was going on and hypersonics really started to take off so the idea of hypersonic missiles is not new at all in fact it's you know almost as old as nuclear missiles themselves nuclear bombs themselves only f about five years um, newer than the, the concept of a nuclear bomb. And I, th and I think the reason that, you know, Russia tends to cling to a lot of these old weapons is because I think there's still, you know, especially with the boomers um, who may do still make up a very large uh, voting block, um, you know, obviously the silent generation and the greatest generation are now mostly gone, right? They'd be all 80 plus or in the case of the silent you know, 80 plus are the greatest generation. In the case of the silent generation, they're all 100 plus, right? You're talking about people that there's not many of them left um, at all, right? So for them, th and then the next generation you have is the boomers, very large cohort. Um, most of them are between, I think, 60 and 80 now. I think late 50s and, and their early 80s, something like that. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I think the boomers would be 1945. So yeah, you're looking at people who are basically between yeah 55 and 75 years old right and then you move on to the gen x which is a relatively small generation then you have the millennials again another big generation um and then yeah then you have gen z and et etc cetera, et cetera. but the baby boomers still do make up a very large cohort of most western countries and their technological prowess isn't the you know it's kind of mocked as known for not being the greatest right those stereotypes even in the 90s of like them not being able to program vcrs and stuff and obviously nowadays now that we're you know 20 30 years later um technology's gone on and they've kind of still stayed in that old state where they don't really know what's going on now, the majority of them don't there's obviously some very tech savvy boomers but most of them are definitely not and when they hear about these weapons that they knew growing up and that were like the pinnacle of weaponry when they were growing up they obviously fear it, and, and to some degree rightfully so, right? These are not to downplay the devastation of these weapons, um, but I think Russia is Russia's very good at psyops. One of the things they've always been amazing at is psyops, and they realize the boomers are by far the most influential political group in America. One, because of the wealth they have. Two, because of their age, right? They're very much seen as the oldest of the still largely alive generations because most of the greatest generation and the silent generation are now gone, um, whereas the majority of the boomers are still around. And thirdly, because they are such a large large voting block, right? So they're, they're a very influential generation in most Western countries up to this day. They have been since, you know, the 70s or 80s when they kind of started to come of age. I guess the 60s and 70s when they started to come of age. And up until this point, right, they've been probably the longest lived generation in terms of influence because of how large they were off the start right and then afterwards because of you know just the wealth they accrued and then because of when they came up and then now the political power they have because now they're at that age where they're the ones in charge of a lot of things and i think russia being very good at psyops knows that it's very easy to play into this and then on top of that you have a lot of people that probably aren't just aware well honestly the majority of people right like most of what we actually know of our government's weapons is 20 years old, right? A lot of the time, when like the SR-71, um, I believe, was developed in the late 60s or early 70s. Um, let me check here. Lockheed Martin SR-71 Blackbird. Yeah, during the 60s, was not declassified until uh, the 90s, if I'm not mistaken. 
Um, let me check here. When was it declassified? Yeah, I can't find specifically when it was declassified, but I believe it was sometime in the 90s, um, 80s or 90s. So generally, what we know of our government technology is actually about 20 years behind what they actually have, right? Because obviously for national security reasons, you can't have the citizens knowing about it because if citizens know about it, that means foreign governments are really, really easily able to uh, you know, acquire this technology. And other than a short period in the 1960s with the space, the really the real beginnings of the space race, Russia's always been out behind in technology because they've largely resort, they've had an inability to develop stuff within their own borders um, because of, you know, before it was because of the lack of capitalism. And now that they are a somewhat capitalist country, although obviously not really they have a lot of problems like corruption and oligarchy and um you know you have to be somewhat tied to the state in order to even start a company or in order for your company to really make money um so it's more of a now it's you know a kind of i wouldn't really call it fascism although there are some similarities to fascism it's kind of like a hybrid between like fascism and crony capitalism in a sense um it's very much what keeps the current russian elite in power and wealthy is what's allowed to happen. Um, and Russia has tried to move away from some of that in some degree. They started building out these tech cities to try and have their own version of Silicon Valley, but with very little success in anything, again, other than what Russia's traditionally been really good at, spying, psyops, and disinformation campaigns. Um, but the spying specifically is where Russia's really gotten a lot of their technology, right? They got most of their nuclear technology from spying, a lot of their rocket technology from spying. And although in this, you know, the 60s specifically, they were developing um, a lot of their own technology and actually ahead of the Western countries for a short while there. Um, before and since that, like, kind of short golden window they had in the 60s, Russia's kind of always just relied on spying, kind of similar to China, right? China has a hard time developing their own technology, but they're really good at spying. Um, and, you know, they have a hard time developing this technology. So, uh, you know, I've kind of been going off on a, lot, a little bit of a tangent here with a kind of, for lack of a better term, pseudo-history lesson, just talking about, like, random technology and stuff. But regardless, I don't think the tsunami bomb is going to happen. I think it's kind of... It's just Russia, Russia posturing again, trying to, you know, fear monger, try to get political pressure on the democratic countries to get their constituents to pull out, especially, you know, with the boomers being such a large voting block. Um, even without the boomers, you have a largely misinformed population or uninformed population. Um, and then the boomers in political power, if they, you know, talk about these weapons that back in the day were cutting edge technology, a lot, of, you know, when the boomers were you know, kids and teens and early adults, uh, you can really scaremonger them into, you know, stepping aside, especially when a lot of them are, there's a large contingent of them that are, I don't, I don't really know if pacifist is the right word, because they're, they're not really pacifists in a sense, they're, they're I, I guess just for lack of a better term, they're, they're kind of like, they're pansies, right, like they, they, they were the hippie generation, and uh, yeah, that, that's, I guess that's all I can say about that, right, they, kind of ride on their coattails of their parents and that's you know about it but um like comment subscribe and i'll see you in the next video